thank you for coming for this presentation about the JDK 7 features. Just a quick introduction about myself. I'm Anil Kumar. I have been working at Intel in the server Java performance area for 10 or 12 years. And uh, with respect to the JDK 7 features, what I can promise you, there will be no hardware slides. There will be no CPU mention. It will be all about Java and JDK features. I'm sure Intel marketing won't like it, but that's how it is today. So quickly going to, we have a lot of material. First, I would like to give a huge credit to Sergey Katkov, who is the Intel Java performance team member, and he's the brain behind many of the implementations and the things we will talk today, I'll share you. Without his contribution, I wish he was here, but due to some of the things, he couldn't. So just a bit, agenda. we have a lot of things to cover, but first, I would like to probably around five minutes of time to go over the, there's not much mystery about the enterprise benchmark. You will see it very soon. So around five or six minutes about the benchmark, uh, which we have worked on. And it's pretty complex benchmark. We'll see a bit later. And then what JDK 7 features we have used in it. The one of the thing I would like to highlight that it is not a toy benchmark. The JDK 7 features we are talking here are not based on some hypothetical cases or some small examples. It's a pretty complex benchmark, and we have tested them for the scaling, and I'll cover them a bit later too. So we have several successes just from the get-go, and there were other cases it was not that good, and what tweak we have to do in them, and at the end, summary and i leave some time for the questions. So first, uh, around five or six minutes for the benchmark. So it, the benchmark name is SpecJB2012. It's going to come soon. So I just want to get a quick idea. How many people here have heard about the Spec Java benchmarks? Just raising the hands. Very few. OK, it will help. I guess I'll go a bit. So the, they. We have right now from the, in the spec, uh, four Java benchmark active, and uh, those are spec JVB, which have been very easy to run, but it was almost like a toy benchmark, which was spec JVB 2005. And that's the one we are replacing from a brand, brand new benchmark, written from scratch, everything, and making it more enterprise Java level benchmark. We already have an enterprise very complex benchmark called SpecJ Enterprise 2010, but that is too complex. It's so complex that probably only 20 to 50 people in the world run it. There are publications, but it's closest to the real world production environment. So we try to make something which be in between, simple to the complex, but at the same time, is still easy to run. Uh, the current benchmark, uh, it emulates a supermarket supply supplier headquarter where we, let's say you're running in a cloud or in that clustered environment, and your everything, the point of sale, the IT employee does the data mining on it, everything running on that IT, so it tried to simulate the complete IT system getting exercised. The benchmark we have tested is already from single node to 64 nodes, we have tested it, and we have made sure with, with the scaling, that is should scale even up to thousands of nodes but we have tested ourselves up to 64 nodes. It uses the latest technology which are available, security, XML, JDK 7 features, so that when the benchmark comes out and the JVM vendors are optimizing for it, the many of these technologies should be optimized by default. And another new thing is it has two metrics called max JOPS for the throughput, and it has a response time metric too. That have been the first time being introduced so you could have some idea from 0% load as you increase to 100% how the uh, response time changes. So that credit is also there. Now let's talk about a bit more about this structure. Though. So I have two more slides on this. First is you can run in many configuration. One is uh, it has three component, controller, transaction injector, and the backends. So controller is just control the complete phase of the run and evaluate at the end to generate your report. Transaction injectors are the load injectors, which actually sends the request to be processed. And the back end is the business logic, which processes those requests and send the response back. 
So you could run it in the single configuration as on the top, single application set, or you could run it as multi-application set deployed in clusters or in the cloud mode. The One of the new thing which was not there before in other benchmarks was that there is a back-end to back-end communication, the inter-Java process communication, because we are seeing many customers using it, and one of, that is one of the component JVMs were not working to optimize that hard. So we hope to use those features. It will help JVM vendors to optimize uh, the inter-process communication. Now a bit more detail about the back-end business process logic. As I talked about, it simulates a supermarket company. So you have multiple supermarkets within the same Java process running. You have supplier interface, and then you have the headquarter. So most of the work is, uh, as a point of sale, goes to supermarkets, where we, they are maintaining their inventory. They, when they need a custom information, they pull from the headquarter. And uh, then they send the receipt after the after the checkout, they send the receipt back to the headquarter and headquarter store the information. How does the JV remote customer, remote interaction happens? It is example, let's say some you are in a Costco or a supermarket and you are visiting from one area to the next, then they are being maintained like Canada entity and the US entity will, will be maintained separately. And if a customer from Canada visiting US, their account information need to be accessed from the uh, other country database. So that's kind of like example we try to do the, so a customer could visit any supermarket and its information could be, it's in local headquarter or could be in the remote. So that will cause the transaction to complete, go to the remote process, get the information and finish it. So that type of remote process information will be there. And it being a benchmark or so, we have set so many properties in the benchmark that you could increase that remote interaction from almost from zero to big amount, as well as there are many other features which you could change a different type of uh, queues. I, if I have time, we'll go at the, towards the end. I have some slides there. So, th so that was about the workload, that it is a scalable workload. It's pretty complex. It does the inter-process communications, and it has many entities which could maintain their own thread pool because supermarket has their own data structure with their own thread pool possible and headquarter could be their own thread pool. So various thread pool working and you could deploy it in a cluster distributed mode or you could run on the same hardware system. So various ways of deploying them. Now let's move to the main areas which we want to talk today are the JDK 7 features which we used and some success stories and some failures. So this is the list I could get from the JDK 7 site about the different features. And we used all the JDK 7 features in this benchmark where possible. No, that was just a kidding part. We, otherwise, we won't be completing it. So here is the real list. And I will, with respect to setting some timeline expectations, the font size is small means I will try to spend less time on those features. And the bigger means that is where I will spend more time. So for example, the quick feature, new IO, Java XML, try with resource, catching with multiple exceptions, underscore numeric literals, and type interfaces, and the thread local random. Those are used. I will go very quickly over them. But the main discussion I want to happen to us the more complex part, which is using fork join. So I think the first slide we should be able to done in seven to eight minutes, and then most of the part would be about fork join. That's where I want to have some main discussion and feedback. So let's about, talk about very first feature about the new IO. So spec JV 2012, by nature, we try to keep it CPU centric and the memory centric and the processing centric. So IO is, we exercise some IO, but it's not, it doesn't influence performance. We use the IO part in generating the report section where it need to handle a lot of files and in different directory structure and create different links and images, et cetera. And what we found during the use that it was very, very convenient way of using them. And we did not find any issue with the new IO API. Once again, we did not stress it to the benchmarking level or so, or did not measure the performance. But our reporter is very complex. It's almost need to handle one to two gig size of the binary log, process it, create 
more than 10,000 the files, which it does in 10, 12 minutes. But we are not putting any performance metric on it, but we did not see any scaling issues. It actually worked pretty well. The next one is the Java XML, and that happens to be when we are doing inter-process communication or in the entities, then we use encryption or sometimes compression and some, on some format to maintain the XML or JXP. So we have used these features. What we did not look, what is new in the JXP, so we did not, so that part we are not sure, but uh, the XML part in the, using JDK 7 works fine. There were some cases where we have seen serialization or deserialization issue and on some architecture, I, if you try to go many, many cores within one single Java process, it could hit the scaling bottleneck. As far as it is clustered, we did not see the issue. But if you go within one huge Java process with 500 or more thread, etc., you might start seeing the issue. But we did, since uh, our benchmark could go more towards the cluster side at, for the node ones, we did not try to really stress it within the single JVM a lot and see what causing the bottleneck issues. The next feature of JDK 7 we use is try with resource. And it is again we use for write and read uh, file operations. This new feature also we use it because it's very convenient. And one of the good thing is you don't need to remember about closing the stream. Once you're done with it, the stream get closed by itself. So that feature we found to be very convenient. And we did not see any issue. It works very flawlessly. The next one is the catching multiple exception types. And uh, in this case also, there are, the way we are doing communication, and there are two type of requests when we want to talk from one Java process to next, and I'll cover later, they, some requests are blocking, where I need to wait a thread to get the response back. So those are synchronous type. There are other asynchronous type, and the communication need to almost communicate between thousand of nodes. It need to keep track of. So that part was very complex. We are using the Grizzly uh, there, and uh, it could throw a different exceptions whose answer is same. So for that part, it actually worked very well for us. It makes the code pretty simple, and uh, it allows actually much less code in terms of cleanliness. And uh, we did not find any issue in this area also. It works pretty good. And uh, we also use the type interface for generic instance creation. So we have a lot of generics and a lot of generic collections. And uh, the diamond part of it actually makes the code very simple or readable, so it was very useful. And it also helped us anytime refactoring of the code result, we could do it much easier. And we did not find any issue with respect to scaling also in the time interface for generic. And the, another interesting one is underscores in the numeric literals. And uh, we have in this benchmark where we are maintaining the response time in microseconds. And many times, due to accuracy, the constant value to compare where the SLAs are, et cetera, you could find several constant of this type with a lot of zeros. And we, we are using it so that it, the, it's easily readable. So that part worked well, too. Now coming to the concurrent utilities. Uh, the new feature also there is the uh, ran the thread local random, and uh, it worked very well. Compared to the old we were using Java util random, it was not scaling that well. The new one actually scales really well, and uh, there was one issue we encountered, there was a bug, where it gives you the same sequence each time. So it's random number, but it was giving same sequence, and uh, we reported that bug also, and I don't know if someone else also reported it at the same time, but it is fixed now in update two. Now I think we'll talk about the last feature, which I have a lot of discussion going on in terms of fork join. So the first question I would like to ask that, how many people are using fork join framework right now? It gives some idea. Could you please raise your hands? Five or six. Wow. OK. I think it might be interesting discussion after that, that uh, what are their experience with that many? 
And let's see, going through what we found in using Fork Joint and what is our experience. So the, the flow I plan to go is just some quick introduction about Fork Joint and uh, what we found, what all changes we did, and a couple of issues we have to do because it's not very straightforward. I guess that's the reason I see like five hands being raised. People are concerned a bit how there is, once it is it works, it works great with respect to scaling. And I think for the new multi-threading, multi-core, it, uh, it should help your application to scale well. But yes, there, it took us months, I will say three or four months or more to actually tune everything and a couple of design decisions we have to do in the, in the benchmark. So let's just quickly talk about the fork joint pool a bit. So what happens, you have a submission queue and you have workers. So there are two queues. Workers have their own individual queues and uh, the main is the submission queue. Any work comes into the submission queue and worker picks, could pick the work from the submission queue or from the worker queue. The, when worker is doing the transaction, it will take the transaction from its only own worker DQ. We'll talk about in that space. But the other workers, so worker takes the work from the head and the all other worker could steal it from the tail. That's what the fork joint is, the work stealing part. Now, let's see how it works. So you have a worker, the new task is always uh, submitted from the worker into its own queue. Let's say worker is split it or worker does create a new task while executing it. That task always goes to the worker queue. And a new task from outside the thread pool, outside the JVM process when it comes in, it always go into the submission queue. So there are two queues. When the internal workers creates it, it always goes into their its own queue. But if a task comes from outside, it goes into the submission queue. So that part is pretty important. You will see in many instances how it impact the decision making, how it impact how you're going to architect it in your application, the, what are the consequences of it. So the, that's how it works. Number one, a thread, when it is looking for a work, it looks, is there a task in my queue, that which, which is D, its own queue, DQ. If it find the task there, perfect, it executed. If it doesn't, then it try to go, can I steal it from someone else? So then it looks in the all other thread DQs, can I steal it from the tail side of it? If it doesn't find anything to steal from there, then it goes to the submission queue and get the task from there. So that is the sequence in the fork joint work mostly. Now let me just took the alternate. What happens in an alternate scenario case when we have a thread pool? So in a thread pool, all the tasks are submitted to the submission queue. So this is a normal case example, and we had this implementation first. And the reason was JDK 7 was not coming there. We were not sure when we started on the benchmark. And each of the entities, supermarket, headquarter, all were using their own thread pools. It is only when the JDK 7 was confirmed we moved to the fork joint, uh, and that was pretty good incentive. So, the task goes to the submission queue, and all the workers need to go to the submission queue, and that is where the contents and happens. And we notice it immediately, any time you need to scale up, there was a big contents on these queues, and it was not easy to resolve it. So that was our motivation, why we decided to move from thread pool to the fork join. So now let's see what happens in the fork join pool and what we ideally want. What we really want that the worker often should get the task from its own queue. That is where the task should be there most of the time. Very rarely a worker should try to go to steal from the others because if the stealing is too much happening, then also you will see uh, issues start happening. And rarely you needed to go to the submission queue to get a work. Because if this, in the fork joint, if that is not happening, and I'll talk about later how you can monitor it, whether it is happening or not. There are API to monitor it, I'll talk later. If that is not happening, then something is not right in your, the way you have architected it, or the way the queue and the task are getting created, they're being generated. But that is the ideal case to, to fork join to work properly. Most of the time you should see work from the worker queue, very rarely stealing, and very rarely going to the main queue. So the, that is what the ideal goal will be. And let's see a couple of scenarios what happens. So 
these are just a example. Let's say a one million size of task comes to the submission queue. So these are a couple of approaches. Now we are talking about implementation of the fork joint, which we tried and then we have to change and what we ultimately did. So when a one million size comes, you could implement an approach which is very naive. That means uh, you immediately take it from the task queue, you now put it into the each worker queue. And what happens uh, when you try to do that, you would have the M thread contention on that queue and it is no different than the thread pool. So we really don't want this approach of the uh, fork joint because otherwise it's no different than the thread pool approach we, we were trying to get away from. Now the, there's a little better which is approach one and that could be that when the work comes in the main batch, one million submitted, the thread one goes which get a notification. That's how it works. A task comes in the batch submission queue and a notification gets sent and the one of the worker will come and pick it. So it, out of one million, it picks the one task and it puts the rest of it its own queue. And now what will happen is another worker looking for the work, they all going to go now at the tail of the worker one and they will try to steal from their one task to do. Now suddenly what you will see in this approach it will work fine if there are only two threads because then only the second thread need to go to this queue and get it from there. But if there are a lot of threads, then again you will start having the contention point just moves to the tail of the thread one. The contention will start happening in this space for that. So this will, be, this will work when you have two or four thread, but this will be totally broken if you have a lot of threads because the contention will happen on the tail. So you do not want this approach. The reason I'm giving an example in fork joint, fork joint does all this work where the tasks come to the batch. I should have a little bit into. Uh. Sorry about the. So the. We were on. So the work come in the main task queue and fork joint does all these things, notification, it does notification for you, it does the how often the worker need to do the polling, how does the work stealing need to happen, it does all that framework. What it doesn't do for you is how are you going to divide that work, how do you want to submit from the main queue to the worker queue. So that part, that is where your a bit architecting comes into play based on the workload and that is where most of our learnings came from. So the approach one did not work because again contents and moved to the tail of the thread one. Now let's go to the approach two, what we did. So a batch comes of one million, the thread one picks it up and it divides it into two. So it picks the half of it, it will do, and it puts the rest of the half in its uh, queue. Now another worker will come and it will go to the tail, it will take it, it will divide it again by half. So out of 500k chunk, it gets the 250 and it puts the remaining into the other queue and the next thread will come and it will again divide it. So it's the bis bisection approach where whatever is in the tail of the other thread, I pick the thing, I take the half of it. And uh, so this one will work pretty good because uh, very soon the work is divided pretty quickly and since we are dividing it in the big enough chunks, there are no contention. So this approach actually works pretty good what we have tested and it scales very well. The, we try to do two approaches, which uh, we did actually some uh, analysis, some performance results on, on the benchmark. And those were, if in one approach I can divide the work by half, so whatever work I picked from the beginning, I divide by half, I take half, put half in my queue, and the other worker will keep dividing. We call it bisection approach. Other one is I could have just divided it by number of workers because I know how many are the default fork join workers in the pool, the minimum one. And we could have divided by equal size of them. So that approach is divided by number of workers. And what we did, we did runs with both of them and we have the batch size around of 1000 tasks when it comes at a one go, a batch. And we did not see any performance impact in either of the approach and we scale them into even in the single node to pretty large values. 
So they actually work pretty well, both the approaches. So I, we li like to recommend here, you could try either of the approach, bisection or divide by number of workers, and they work pretty good. The only thing we could say that what we have not done is the extreme small batch size or a really huge batch size. Let's say the batch size is really 10,000, 1 million, or if it is only 10. So we could go back and update the data with those things. We did not. But at least for the medium sized batch sizes, either of the approach work fine with respect to splitting the work. Now let's try to, I talked about the monitoring. If you are seeing some issues on your fork joint pool, what can you do about it? So there are these uh, six or seven APIs here that uh, which tells you get parallelism is number of target workers, pool size is number of live workers. So and I will cover that part. What the fork joint approach, it has at least two approaches. In one case, it can increase the number of thread pool workers a lot. So you define a minimum, the default size, and then it can grow to a lot, it can shrink back. Grow a lot means infinite, and then shrink back. And we'll talk approach. Another one is fixed. You don't allow it to change. So that is why you have the get pool size, how many worker at the time fork joint has created. Another APIs are about how many uh, submission queue count. So that way, let's say some tasks are coming and you want to monitor your queue size for the load balancing purpose. So you, ca you have the two queue because in one case it gives you how many tasks are waiting in your main submission queue and another API gives you how many tasks are waiting in the total in the worker queues, those, those D queues, because the task could be in either of them. So by having some idea of the total number of tasks there, you could try to do the load balancing on that. And we try, in the benchmark, we have two modes. We call them intrusive mode, where we are doing a lot of profiling, and we use these APIs there to, to debug the issues, because there were several issues came. That is how we did our approach of submitting batches and the study that what works best and which did not work and why. And in the regular mode of the compliant mode, we didn't want to access the API, so we did not use. But what we have done, we try to invoke these APIs every one millisecond to that frequency. That means 1,000 times in one second. And we did not almost see no impact on the performance of the full system. So that was pretty interesting. We thought there might have been reasonably overhead. And with respect to the number of tasks, number of thread, your results will not be like accurate at the time because there's a parallelism going on, the workers are stealing, but approximately they are pretty close. And they are able to give you idea when you are designing different approach of submitting into the queue, which approach works for you, how your queues are growing, and particularly for the load balancing. They're pretty approximate enough. So I, at least in our experience, looks like these APIs are pretty lightweight and could be used. Now a bit uh, about what happens. So I'm running one JVM process. Should I be using one fork join pool or should I be using many? For example, in our case, we have supermarket. Each supermarket having their own data structure, own inventory, own checking out process. And th there are headquarters and then there are suppliers also. I try to show here only supermarket and headquarter. They are the one main entities which exercise a lot. So the another decision was, should I go with one fork joint thread pool or many thread pool? For, we call them entities. So should I go for one type of entity, one thread pool? So there were the two approaches we have tried. What we found in the beginning, we tried the one fork joint thread pool per entity. So the way by default uh, fork joint thread pool create the number of default thread is total number of logical processes are available. And as a result, you would have an oversaturation. On the left side here is when you have one fork join thread pool per entity, then load balancing becomes a problem. Because in that case, if any one of them is hogging all the resources, the other one will be starving and there is no way for you to balance it out. You are at the mercy there. The, and so in that case, we found that the load balancing is easy with one fork joint pool per JVM process. And that's the one we are using in the benchmark. The other problem was with respect to using several fork joint thread pool per JVM was the communication. So let's say 
supermarket need to interact with the headquarters to get the customer information. That it need to come back, process the transaction for checkout. It need to go to the headquarters again, and then it need to send the receipt for the storage. So it is possible, and we have a local caching in the supermarket where another information comes and go. So it is possible that when these, we call them remote communication, when the one fork joint thread will need to talk to the other one, so we call it remote communication. It is possible you could have a circular deadlock. And uh, you need to then make sure that's not happening when you have multiple thread pool. In the single thread pool, that's not going to happen. So if you could implement, we advise going with one fork joint thread pool per JVM process. But there is another spin on it. Let's. So another one is, this is just another example. What happened now? We talked about that our benchmark has inter-Java communication process. So, and it is also possible we could deploy supermarkets in one JVM instance, headquarter in the another JVM instance. So now they are two separate Java processes. And each Java process, as we just talked, has one fork join thread pool each. What happened, there is a remote communication now, because one JVM need to get information from the other, and they are pretty equal typed. It might have to get some information from the JVM one. So again, you need to know your flow graph here. And it is possible that you could have a circular deadlock again. And your application will hang. Because, so you need to make sure in your flow chart that you're not having the circular deadlock, one depending on the other, and you can't. So one of the examples would be, let's say JVM1 has the eight threads. And we'll talk about the approach a bit uh, later. And another one has eight thread. These eights are waiting for some work to be done by the JVM2. And these eights from the JVM2 get waiting to get work from JVM1, deadlock. Nothing will happen. You will hang, system will hang. So let's see what happens actually in the fork joint case of the remote communication. The next two slides talks about what really happens. So we have a task from the JVM process one. It needs to be sent to the another JVM. That thread is blocking. So this approach is blocking approach. So thread is blocking for the response. And the fork join thread pool knows that it is waiting on the work to be response to come from the another JVM. So it puts into the parking. And it is just waiting for the response from the other. And so what happens meanwhile, when you have a managed blocker approach in the fork join, so that's what they call it, managed blocker, managed blocker approach. So when the fork join checks, oh, my one of the thread is waiting the response from the another, J, another process, it actually creates a new thread. And that thread goes and picks the work to be done. Because otherwise what will happen, you will all wait and system will have almost very low CPU utilization of the work being done. So that is how the fork join does uh, this handling that it, when it detect the thread is waiting for the other work response to come from other, it creates a new thread. Now what could happen? So we have a remote customer. I, we are doing very heavy customer processing in the supermarket. These customer need to get some information from the headquarter, which is in the another JVM, and it is taking time. For whatever reason, it's slow. The GC, GC pause might have happened on the other JVM, running old parallel, no response coming. Suddenly, my 30, 40, or 48, 64 threads are all waiting for the response. Nothing will be processed locally, even though I had the work. So folk joint actually start spinning new thread, new thread. And most of the time works, but what happened, cases happen where the remote communication was ultimately several of the threads, hundreds of the thread, just waiting for the response from the other JVM because it was taking longer and longer. And this one start creating more and more thread. And we saw 35,000 or 100,000 thread getting created by the fork joint pool. There is no control on it. You cannot control it. So that is one of the drawback of the managed blocker where it infinitely grows. And it could actually kill or hang your system or process if you don't control it. So, and we, we saw that behavior in SpecJ 2012. When we enabled the remote transactions, it was going more than 32,000 threads and system was hanging. So then we did the alternate approach. That's a bit our solution there was we, we created a code to have a bottleneck on the managed blocker. So it's a, we could put that code the way we made it work into, if you send me email, we can give you how we did. So in that case, we put a maximum limit. And the 
thread, many thread blocker checks it, have I reached my max limit? And if it has reached, then it will not create the new thread. So that way you are guaranteed that it will not go infinite and your system will not crash. So it solves that part. But the another problem is now you can't grow infinitely and your n number of threads which you put maximum all could be waiting from the another process and another process could be wait. So in terms of architecture, you do need to know a bit, am I again causing circular deadlock? It doesn't solve the circular deadlock problem. It solves your application crashing problem, but it doesn't close, stops your circular deadlock. So you could still, and that happened. So we did the managed blocker approach and now deadlock happened. System wouldn't crash, but deadlock. So what we did for that one? So here is an example, we call it tier approach. So remember I advised that we would have only one fork join thread pool per JVM process. Yes, our main thread pool, the level one, tier one, let's call it, is one JVM per process. But what happens, the way we solve this approach was, if the, from a JVM one, let's say supermarket, the tier one need to send any request it need by the JVM two, the request will not go in the tier one, it will go in the tier two. And if any request from a tier two from the other JVM, let's say, because the transaction requires subcomponents, it need to come to the other JVM, it goes to the next level tier. So a bit in this approach, you need to know what is the highest dependency is on your flow. And uh, it was, logic was simple. If any tier N need to send a request, remote request, it goes to N plus one tier. So there is all, and we make sure based on the dependency, maximum dependency, we have enough tiers. And that is how, so most of the time we operate in the tier one, fork joint pool, and very few times we have to go to tier two, tier three based on how much remote traffic is happening. And uh, we can see from the monitoring API, et cetera. So this approach works best for us in the, in the benchmark application and it, it scales fine and we did not see any more contact switch or going to, because we, in this managed blocker approach, we are keeping the thread fix in the fork gen thread pool. We are not letting them grow infinite because that's really bad problem for the production environment. It could actually shut down or hang. That's what it don't want. So we rather have the uh, tier approach and make sure we have enough tiers so you will get a response back. You will not have a deadlock happen. The worst case here could be you could be slower as far as you have enough uh, uh, tiers. So there might be some contact switching rate higher if you have higher remote traffic sometime, but they do come down. The one of the good thing about the fork join thread pool is if you're not using them, they're almost zero. They, you don't have a overhead. So the extra tiers only become active if there's a work, if there's a request. Otherwise they go down, no overhead on the system and system is operating most of the time. So that's the approach uh, we found in the benchmark which worked really good for us. So uh, let me summarize on this one. So yes, we have a recommendation of fork gen thread pool per JVM one, load balancing nice, but we use the managed blocker limit, otherwise it can grow to infinite which is not good. And in that case, you might be in the deadlock and that would just make sure in your flow how many tier you might need. And uh, that's the message summary. So now, as I talked earlier, there are two type of requests could go from the thread, fork join thread pool. One is blocked type, where I am waiting for the response, I go into the parking, I will get the response back, same thread will pick the work when response come back and finishes it. Another is asynchronous approach and you could have based on what you really need to do, these two different things. In the asynchronous approach, I send the task to the another JVM and the thread goes pick something else. It's a producer consumer approach. So that also there in the folk join uh, pool where I could send the asynchronous task to another JVM. What was happening there, we thought the common sense was telling us there, one of the way we could re make it better was that making it buffering, and I think I'll talk about that one, that we could do when the tasks are coming, all these tasks go to the main queue. As we talked about in the fork join thread pool, you have the worker thread and the main queue. All the tasks, whether it is request or messages, they go into the main queue. 
So the, here I was just trying to summarize that uh, the one was blocking and another asynchronous messages. Let's go to the asynchronous message slide. So this is, we call it task buffering. And we thought on the common approach, it would be a good idea to buffer them. Because otherwise, the small amount of work and task going to the other one, and we keep interrupting each time. So we thought it will be efficient to buffer them and then put it in the buffer queue. That way, it's a bigger chunk of the batch, and you can easily process it. But it, we saw a bottleneck, and we were surprised, like, what's going on? It, it wasn't scaling. And what we found was that in terms of execution order, the way the different tasks are coming, without buffering, they were actually intermingling well between each other. But when we start doing buffering, the way they were coalescing, you have the same type of task coming together next to each other. And when threads were picking them and start executing it, what we found that many of the tasks were going to the same data structure, to the similar thing, and a very heavy contention was happening on those data thread. So I think this one is a bit about your access pattern in the way it happened in our bench, in the workload there. And the our learning there was then we decided not to use buffering because we found that the tasks are going to the some same hotspot at the same time. So for us, in this case, without buffering actually worked better than the buffering would have been. But if these tasks if with buffering would have been mixed and not going to the hot places, probably the buffering would have been better. So what we learned from this was if similar task in the remote JVM going to the very same hot place, you might have a big contention issue and you may want to watch for it. Because remember, the buff without buff buffering, you might have even some more timeline. Let's say I'm going to buffer for 200 milliseconds. If I wouldn't have, then we would have been tasked much more gap between them. But when we buffer, then they go just boom, all of them together, much bigger contention. So it's the coalescing effect also in the same structure was pretty bad for us. Now a bit about the fork joint. Another feature of the fork joint is the join part. So what happens a bit about the join part? You have a task A. Task A, the thread one actually takes some of it and the rest of it goes to its tail. And from the tail, the ta thread two could come. It could take some part of it and it could, another thread comes. And then at the end, they will become joined. So if you have the batch size where it need to be broken and that it need to be joined, it work actually really well. And uh, where we exercise this part is in our reporter. What happens in our reporter, we have many gigabytes of the data coming out of the benchmark. And then at the end, we want to correlate several things, produce report and several components need to be combined and they have some dependency. So the part here work really well is the dependency, the the way the join works. It's very easy, the way you can define the joining of these tasks. And it, it actually scales very well. And uh, it, the challenges were you need to know your flow. So it doesn't do the dependency checking for you. So let's say you have some blocks and you need to join them. When you're defining, you need to do the good job of joining the dependencies. If you make a mistake in the dependency, your JVM will hang. So that does require a bit uh, making sure that you are careful when you are writing your code for joining them. But once you do it right, it actually really works super fast. Our, we cut down the time by like 10x. When the reporter was working without the dependency in a serial manner to process that two to three gig of the information took us in some bigger cases, the detailed one was like 30, 40 minutes, and it cut down to five minutes with the join and dependency part. But there's a risk of you do need to know the flow and make sure you're not causing deadlocks. Otherwise, it will hang. And it did, actually, when we did one mistake. Now, talk, so those were the success stories where we were able to use both type of messages, solve the blocking problem, a bit summary, use one fork joint pool with the tier approach and use the message, identify the problem with the message buffering and we did it fine. The one case here for the fork joint we couldn't solve and that is we have one type of transaction, let's say in the supermarket where the 
the complete list need to be bought online and it need to be bought from several instances. So let's say a customer is buying 20 items and each and he's online and each item need to be scanned in any of the supermarket, any of the JVM. And you let's say you have 512 nodes running. So for that one, I, and I need to process 20 items. For each item now, I need to go quickly, ask each other JVM, which could be hundreds of them, do you have this item and who can give me? So what happened, that transaction almost required huge amount of interactions from the other JVM processes, but the work done was tiny. By the time that item goes to the other JVM process, the work is take that one, compare it to the concurrent hash map to find the item, if it is there, reserve it and tell the other JVM I have it. So the work done was tiny, the overhead was uh, pretty good for the transport to come uh, to serialize, deserialize, marshalling and marshalling. So one transaction was requiring a lot of interactions and the work is very tiny. What happened when we enable this transaction? Because we have all properties where we could uh, reduce size, how much time to active, what is the request mix. When we even put 1% of the transactions out of all this, of this type, the system tanked. The resource uh, CPU utilization came down from 90% to below 30%. Performance dropped 10x probably. And we need to get the benchmark out, and this was not our, we solve enough problems, we thought we have done enough JDK 7 feature use. Due to lack of time, we did not try to debug the issue, but we do think that if you have a very fine grain inter-process communication, then either there's a contention happening, or there's a lot of network for that many requests, or it is blocking on some load unbalancing, but we couldn't debug the issue so our benchmark worked fine when there was a little more coarse-grained interaction. And uh, the fork joint and thread pool and other thing worked very fine. But when it was a very fine grain, very often communication, uh, it did not scale. And we do not have the solution to that one. You, it probably required more into the network stack and doing it better load balancing, but that was our failure case where we do not have a recommendation or solution for that space. Now going to my question again. So before I saw five people probably raise their hand about the joining the fork joint, the way it has worked pretty well after we found a couple of cases and we have scaled them almost up to 64 node, no performance issue, very nice CPU utilization, et cetera. My question is, is, does it give encouragement or more and to uh, more people to use folk joint or how anyone feeling? Any guys who are challenging to use it? Hey, I got my worth of the presentation, at least 10 guys interested. So feel free if you have uh, like questions, I will put the email at the end and the spec benchmark code, uh, depending on your work. If you have license, then the source code, everything is free. Uh, it's available with a kit and uh, otherwise you can come talk to me and we can see what examples and things could be shared for the folk join. We might try to put actually a white paper if that will help with more examples on, in this case. Because we do think that it, it does, when it works, it works great, but it does require some tuning. It's not like out of box, it, uh, unless it is a toy case, you create some easy matrix multiplication, those type of things. It does, it's actually does require some tuning, does require some re-architecting, does require knowing your dependency part. So now th there were some other uh, things we did. So those are not JDK 7 related. I wasn't sure how the time will go. Either we could go in the question answer or uh, in two or three minutes, I could just show you the couple of other things we learned from the benchmark. And those are, let me just go through two or three minutes and then we'll go questions. So we have unbounded queues or the sampling buffer, a lot of them being used in our benchmark for like message buffering, invoice, installment purchase, or receipt or data mining. And what we found that uh, there were scaling issues. Those things were not scaling. Other than once the fork joint was working, several other things were not scaling. And so we, in our benchmark, we have, just by property, we can change by using the factory method, what type of queues we want in, in those structures. So we tried the concurrent link uh, CLQ, concurrent link queue, we tried the link blocking queue, we tried the striping of them, and we found that if the transactions are big, so we have many types of transactions, some are very light, others are very heavy. So if the transactions 
are light, then you will find that concurrent link queue or the stripes are better. The otherwise, otherwise we didn't see any difference in them. With respect to the concurrent collections, we could have the queue sampling buffer, which is blocked and you pull out of it or so, or for other buffering, we are using circular array, or we could use a random array. What we found that there was no visible difference between any of them, unless uh, your transactions are light, then random array works out for the best. The next one is circular array. The queue sampling buffer becomes terrible. It becomes a bottleneck on the performance if your transaction is very light. Whatever item you're putting in and out very often, queue sampling buffer was terrible in terms of scaling. And uh, we have to go actually to the either the ra circular array or random array. So don't think it would, all, once you start implementing with a fork joint uh, pool, et cetera, it's always a fork joint pool fault. Many times it's actually these arrays and buffers were not scaling. Now just the summary that we try to use, I think most challenging one with the fork joint to use it, and we, I think I would give ourselves A grade, just we didn't solve the very thin lightweight when the interaction is very often and high frequency one. It might be important for some, and we will try to probably some other time try to see what's going on there. But I think we did a pretty good job on solving in a pretty complex environment, a pretty real case, communicating in an enterprise level Java using not just a toy. And uh, it scales well when it needs. It does need you to be advanced, medium to advanced level programming. The, because you do need to know your dependency, you do need to know your you're not causing deadlock and how to do the manage block because it did require us almost a month on the complex problem to debug and go with the alternate solution on the part. I think with that, uh, this is my email and uh, you feel free if you have questions and we do plan to put white paper in this area, looks like pretty interesting at the rate people want to use it. We want it to scale well for the multi-threaded multi architectures more and more coming and we do want it to succeed. Thank you everyone and I think I'm open for the questions or